Okay, um, first of all, thank you and welcome. Um, thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning. So far, no raindrops, but I assume we'll see some. Uh, I'm Paul Pinsky, your state senator, and uh, welcome you today. Uh, we have uh, a number of people we want to hear from. We want to keep this efficient and not keep you here too long. So let me give you the, uh, the lay of the land, how we're going to handle this, because uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. What we're going to do um, is have your delegates and uh, school board uh, representative. Uh, they're each going to share some things on their mind and what they've accomplished or what they think is important. They're going to take about three minutes, and then we're going to open it up to you for about five minutes for each candidate to ask any question about policy, what they're doing on the state level, a concern you have, but we're going to be real strict on the time because we don't want this to go on too long. We appreciate you taking the time uh, coming here this morning. So we're going to go through ourselves. Um, uh, uh, Councilwoman Negleros is out of town, um, but we're hoping Councilmember Turner will join us, uh, who represents Greenbelt. And we're going to go through that. Uh, each candidate, uh, not candidate, each representative, uh, three minutes and then up to five minutes of questions and then we'll go on to the next person. And then at the end, if we have a couple of minutes, we'll take a couple of quick follow-up questions. When that's over, uh, by that time, we're going to be joined by Maryland's Attorney General Brian Frosch, hopefully, um, and he's going to talk about the upcoming election. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can help. Uh, we have sign-up sheets in the back for many precincts that the 22nd District and uh, Council Matic Districts represent. And we're going to ask you if you have uh, a few moments to take your shift, either for early voting or for elect, uh, election day, uh, to sign up for a shift if you're up to it. Uh, and also, as you can see, we have lawn signs in the back from, uh, from our team members, uh, from the 22nd District and the people we're endorsing. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep it to an hour and a half. Uh, there's, there's coffee, donuts, and water. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty informal. So that's uh, how we're going to handle this. Um, so with that, uh, as I said, I'm State Senator Paul Pinsky. I'm going to start off, and I'm going to hold my question time because I want to get to these people. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, three quick minutes uh, and talk about one or two issues, and I should be on the timer as well. So staff, um, uh, I'm on the timer starting now. Uh, I'm just going to mention one piece of legislation that I'm pretty proud of, and I shared this with many of you uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I've been working for over two years to make sure that community college should be free to all people of all of our cities. Uh, for Garrett County, to ensure the pretty sure it's county of all of our city. Uh, it raises people's um, income earnings, which means it brings in more tax money, it helps people thrive, and it's taken a couple of years, and uh, finally this year, uh, after bringing together people from the Senate and the House and the, the Chairman and the Speaker of the House and the Senate President, uh, we were able to put aside $15 million. So anyone who graduates high school and wants to go to community college within two years of graduating, uh, it will virtually be free. We, in the last day of session, we actually got an extra $5 million. And we moved that quickly in 24 hours. Now, we're not sure if we think it will cover four or 5,000 or 5,000 plus people. It might not cover everyone, uh, but it's last dollars. So those who actually get uh, financial aid, that money comes first. This will supplement it for any child of a family making less than $150,000 or a single parent making less than $100,000. Um, at the end of the day, there's a retiring state delegate who's worked on this for many years but never got over the goal line. Uh, they put the bill actually in his name, but I'm pretty proud that we finally, for Maryland, we joined like six or eight other states that now community college should be free for anybody in the state who makes some of that income. Now, yeah. <laughs> some, some jurisdictions, uh, Garrett County's had one for five or eight years. I know Prince George has started a pilot. They got $500,000. But this time, the whole state of Maryland, wherever you live, Baltimore County, Charles County, Baltimore City, Prince George is already going to benefit from this. And I think it's a great accomplishment. It puts us in the top two cities in the country. So I'm going to stop with that. There are other issues we can talk about uh, later. Uh, I'm going to stop with that. If you have to join, uh, I should introduce all of them. Uh, County, Council, 
County Council Member Ty Turner, uh, who represents uh, Greenbelt and Bowie and of other areas. I should have uh, recognized everyone. The three delegates, Juan Gaines, Ann Healy, along to Washington, and the school board representative, Lucy Brady. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to go to, um, I guess we'll show the chief. Okay. Uh, three minutes on the clock, staff. Well, as I said, I do the, the funding. 
There is no funding. I do the transportation funding. That's the transportation, that's all funding for the state of Maryland. That's the transportation authority, which they're saying would be responsible for those toll lanes, um, for, for the, uh, the, the revamp of 295. The governor said multiple things, and you gotta remember that this is the luxury year. So he wants to expand 295, and he also wants to put the, the uh, Mac lab right down the middle of it. That doesn't work. I don't believe those things will work. I know they don't work for me. Yeah. Right. We as a team are doing everything in our power. I, as I said, I serve on the Appropriations Committee for Transportation and the Environment. My colleague here serves on the Environment and Transportation Subcommittee. So we have to do policy through that committee, but the budget is, takes everything into account. Keep advocating. Keep it up. Keep up the pressure. This is an election year. You know, when the governor says, oh, it's not, it's a private, it's federal land, everything has to come through that budget. If federal land, I mean, federal revenue comes into the state, it comes in under one of those subcommittees. I would see that. And I would more than likely hold it, modify it, ask questions. Do everything I can to slow it down. Keep up, keep up the work. I mean, you know, letters, oh, of course, emails, bombard them with protests, everything that you know, you've been doing. I heard you loud and clear, and I was happy that you kind of agreed with me. Uh, yes. There's no generic responses. When you get thousands of emails, there's a standard response. And the response is that we hear you. We hear you and we will, you know, address it in the best possible way that we can. That's why you got that budget language. Right. You mean what does the governor have? I don't I don't write to the governor, so well, governor
really what I'd like to talk about, I happen to serve as the chairman of the Rules and Executive Nominations Committee of the House of Delegates. And um, I also am a chair of a subcommittee on local government and bi-county agencies on the committee that I, uh, the other committee I serve on, which is the Environment and Transportation Committee. So there's a lot of um, support, mutual support back and forth on those issues. Um, I'm involved with the policy creation rather than the money involved. Although policy does drive budgets and vice versa. So a couple things that we did, we got the Metro funding and it wasn't just a budget issue because it's a five year program. It's policy that we are gonna fund Metro being repaired, restored so that people can continue to use it. That's uh, $167 million a year for five years. And that was a policy decision that we made. We restored the highway user money for the local government so that so that was, during the big recession, that was kind of whittled away to almost nothing. And now we started another five-year program to restore that so that the local governments can repair the streets in the towns and so forth. All the, all the potholes and all that. Very, very specific kind of practical things. But we've also done some big policy things. Well, we uh, created a situation, you know, um, Emergency vehicles get the right away, they get lights and sirens, they can cut through traffic as needed. We saw that there's a need for another kind of vehicle to do that, and that's vehicles that are carrying organs that are needed to be transplanted. And they have to get to one, from one hospital to another as quickly as possible. They get flown in and they have to be moved to a location quickly. So we passed legislation to give those kind of vehicles that are transporting um, organs to be transplanted will have the same kind of ability to have lights and sirens and cut through traffic and get to where they need to go as quickly as possible. Um, another issue, another basic kind of safety issue uh, has to do with when we have a move over law when you, there's a car on the side of the road and it's broken down, there's a police car comes by Many policemen have been hit and killed standing on the side of the road. So we have now a law in place that says if you see that on the right hand side of the road, you have to either move over a lane or slow down to give them safe passage. And we just this year extended that to all the vehicles that would have the lights, and si not sirens, but lights, the yellow lights, trash trucks, um, emergency vehicles, obviously emergency vehicles, but also tow trucks, all kinds of things, so that uh, it's just safer for people on the road. So that, that's the kind of policy issues that we deal with. Um, I want to get back for a second to MAGLA, because one of the bills that I put in was adjusted. There's a, in addition to MAGLA and widening the, the putting toll lanes alongside the parkway, the governor is also going along with the concept of building something called a hyperloop, which is like this tube that would go under the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. And that, because it was being done in, entirely with, with private money and no government involvement at all, was getting a free pass. They weren't doing any environmental studies. A bill that I put in to slow down MAGLA actually was adjusted to make sure that hyperloop has to follow environmental studies as well. So there's a, we're trying to do the best we can to make sure that if, if MAGLA or any of these things go through, the, the proper study has been done. Okay, but, uh, and on that note, uh, but I do want to mention that bill was vetoed by the governor. Oh. Uh, even though all called for was a study, an environmental study before they proceed, the governor vetoed it. We're going to open up for questions or anything Ann has talked about or something she hasn't talked about. Uh, we're among friends here, so yeah. Want more information about something or about another issue? Uh, just raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would ask, ask you, uh, my professor chairman, and someone who couched uh, a lot about pornography. Uh, four years ago, and it was. Okay, let me. Uh, I, 
the, okay, first of all, yeah, the rules committee deals with not just um, late file bills, which is the most of what we do, but we also have uh, any house joint resolutions are the purview of the rules committee. And we have a policy in the House of Delegates that um, resolutions that, that we want to pass are things that are actually going to accomplish something. So like when we wanted to um, recognize the birth date of um, civil rights leader Frederick Douglass on his 200th birthday, that was something that was actually doing something. But what, we, what this, this kind of resolution that this person is talking about, asking Congress to do something about pornography, is um, really not something that the state gets involved in. If it's a congressional, it's a federal issue. And so the committee has, as a matter of policy, not moved forward with those kind of resolutions probably for the last 10 years. I've been the chair for the last three years. So. seen it 
That's why I passed a bill to ensure that uh, some of our nonprofits that go door to door and do grassroots efforts to get kids into college and take them through the access process, the college access process, uh, to fund them. The state's never funded these grassroots organizations. And finally, we funded them uh, with $250,000. And we're impacting thousands of students to, grab, to bring them into college. Now, I know you're going to say college isn't for everybody, but education is. And I believe in education. And we did that right here in Parkdale. It's because of a bill that I passed that now Parkdale has over 100 more students entering into a program and now graduating uh, from high school and going to college. Uh, that's something that I've been working on. <laughs> Senator Pinsky mentioned free tuition for community college, and he said that you know the state of Maryland got involved in it. Well, they didn't get involved until I did something uh, at the county level where I actually passed a bill that would create a study to look and see how we can actually fund it for our county. Because four other jurisdictions in our, in our state have done this before and made no, and the city of Detroit has even done it. And I said that let's get together with Dr. Dukes of the, of the Prince George's Community College and figure out how can we make this happen in Prince George's County because our kids, des our kids deserve it, our students deserve it. And so with our study that Dr. Dukes and I put together and a whole group of other people, uh, we, uh, we uh, presented it to the county executive and he put $1.7 billion, $1 million in a budget uh, two years ago uh, to fund the actual program. So now we have 500 students now in the program working for free tuition for a community college. Now I found $100,000, $1.7 million. And I have to thank Todd Turner for approving that as well. Um, these are big things and big issues that we've taken on. I know Paul's about to kick me off this thing real quick, but I'm gonna mention, I'm gonna mention one other thing. Um, affordable housing. It's a big issue in our community, especially for our seniors. You know, we have low-income families. I grew up, I was homeless and grew up in some of the affordable housing, affordable housing um, uh, options in the county. And so what I did was pass a bill that created the Capital Bellway Economic Development Fund. And what that fund would do is provide funding to, uh, to nonprofits, to government entities like municipalities to fund affordable housing projects including the Glendale Hospital site. I passed the bill to make sure that we can have affordable housing options at, our, at, our, at the Glendale Hospital site as well. I've, I've taken on a lot of issues and I've done a lot of things. I didn't pass 30 pieces of legislation for nothing. Um, three minutes isn't enough for me to explain to you the impact that I've had at the state. So I want to just thank you all for having me as your delegate. And I'll take any questions from anyone if you have any. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll take your question. Okay. You said you had 35 events. Yes, not, not, not last quarter, the last, last four years. Last four years? Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to know why you have had 35 events and we can have, have not been invited to any of them. So that's, that's, not, that's not true when we talked about this before. No, it is true. Well, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. That's not true. Because I, I, let, me, let me finish. You gotta let me talk. <laughs> let me talk. I, I've invited, I invited uh, Mr. Emmanuel to my meetings. He gets the emails. He, send, he sends them out. He's on my email list. I go to your I go to your civic association meetings. And I go to your civic association meetings and tell you where I'm having these events. Everybody in this everybody in this room receives my information and have, have attended my events. They've attended, they've attended my events. So I, I'm just telling you they attended my events. I, I I put it out there. I'm talking about these nights. I'm talking about you come to two meetings in the last year, four years. No ma'am. Yes, okay. and I attend them all except for the last one. No, okay. I, yes. Let me, let me, let me. 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 Let me.
That's a that's a great that's a great point. And thank you for your service too. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's going to piss in us on the current commission where we're looking at the funding formulas uh, for the state. If you remember the Thornton the Thornton commission, they were changing the funding formulas about 15 years ago. Uh, we sit on the commission where we're actually changing uh, the funding formulas and changing how we actually um, you know teacher training. We're looking at funding, making sure that we can um, attract better teachers, increase the salaries for our teachers too at a wage where they are paid similar to architects and engineers, you know, things of that nature. Have wraparound services for our schools, you know, community schools is a big deal. And if you have those wraparound services for uh, students as such as in Beacon Heights Elementary School, you know, they can help those students and actually um, Welcome through the process of getting the services that they need so they can survive. And I, I think that question mostly is for Lupe. We can answer that question mostly, so I'll leave it to her. Yes? So, I, I like the second part you said. You know, I'd like to more, more advanced uh, funding for our schools. Because it's not the money, it's, it's having this family. And, you know, we have a friendly, dysfunctional school system. And it's not the money, it's a result of the I also think it's another direct question for Lupe too, uh, but I, I put in bills, and you know this, uh, for an inspector general for our school system to look at our dollars and make sure our dollars are actually tracked and make sure they're secure and make sure we, 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 we get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse in our school system. The state of Maryland, we don't get we don't we don't get credit for this, but we send to the to Prince George's County Public Schools 1.1 billion dollars uh, to our school system. And that, that's the highest of any other jurisdiction in, in the state of Maryland, okay? And that money goes to our school system. And right now, I believe the school system budget is about 1.9, almost 2 billion now. Um, and so we, we give a lot of money to our school system, and we want to make sure that money is spent wisely and spent well. And that's one of the ideas that I came up with. That passed the House of Delegates, got it to the Senate. It passed the House of Delegates unanimously, and got it to the Senate, and unfortunately died in the Senate. Um, but we've been working really hard to make sure that we can, I've, I've been working really hard to make sure we can hold our school system accountable. Time for, well, hold on, we have time for one more, well, I'll be sure, but one more question, ma'am. We, we're, we're, we're in limited resources at the state. We cannot send out mailers like our county council members can. Let me, but that, you're, asking for, you're asking for us to, see, to notify you. And I'm telling you our limitations. We can't send out letters to you. The state prevents us from doing that. We cannot do that. Let me, let, me, let me finish. And we send out emails because that's our primary source of getting information to people. I've been in your community and I knocked on doors even when it wasn't election season and informed people of what we've done for their with for their legislative session in our legislative session. I've knocked on doors specifically every door and dropped off flyers for a mag lab meeting that I hosted that that had over three hundred people attended at Roosevelt High School. I hosted that meeting. And I've been there just giving out information to people because I do the outreach. I go door to door. I I I'm out here. <laughs> I don't do this for no reason. And people in this community can tell you that. I don't, I don't sit on my laurels. I don't sit and wait for people to tell me what to do. I'm proactive at my job. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, hold, hold on. We're gonna, we're gonna move on to Council Member uh, Turner. Just to, just let me reiterate something. You know, I, for example, hold a town hall meeting in early December every year. I do a robo call because I can't mail. And even for the robo call, I have to pay out of my campaign account. I can't use, we can't use public funds. So we are limited, actually. So let me just finish. Either we develop email lists and we do the best we can, or, you know, and we also have, I think, 28 civic associations and we have seven incorporated towns, uh, Hyattsville, uh, Greenbelt, et cetera, and it's tough to get around to all of them, and I know it's frustrating. We try to do what we can do, the whole team does. Um, 
but we have certain limits by the state government that we can't use their money to publicize. And we also don't have the staffs because we're a part, we're a part time legislature. We, many of us hold other jobs as well. So it's just a little different. No, well, they probably don't, but accumulating them is something we just have to do the best we can at developing. Okay. I will only say that everybody here does stuff throughout the four years. I, I don't wait till election year to have a town hall meeting. I do it every December, no matter what. I send out a newsletter twice a year, no matter what. I can't send it to everybody in the district. I send it to 8,000 people, but that comes from money I've, I've had to raise. So when I raise money, I try to use my money to educate other folks and share what we're doing, and everyone else tries to do the same. With that, we're gonna to go to Council Member Todd Turner, uh, Vice Chairman of the County Council. Um, he is one of two who covers most of our district. Uh, the third one in Hyattsville uh, is um, uh, Danny Tavares, and she's been challenged by uh, Candace Hollingsworth. As I said, Danielle, who's chair of the council, is on a founding responsibility out of town. She's shepherding, I think, uh, 12, uh, 12 year olds. Uh, and, you know, you got you to gotta put time aside for family. Doing that. So today, Todd Turner, Todd Thank you, Paul, and thank you very much for the 22nd team. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate you being out here this morning uh, as part of the event today. Um, I just want to touch on four topics real quickly. Uh, Paul already mentioned, unfortunately, uh, Danielle, who's chair of the council this year, is not able to attend this morning. She's whitewater rafting with her, green, uh, her Girl Scout troop, uh, which seems like interesting. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, so let me just touch on four things, uh, some of which have been mentioned here today. The first one I'll touch on, um, back on May 24th, uh, the County Council adopted the fiscal year 2019 budget. It's the largest budget in Prince George's County's history, over $4 billion if you add up all the funds. As part of that, as uh, uh, Alonzo mentioned, uh, obviously the lion's share of that goes to public school education, over $2 billion uh, goes to public school education. As part of that, as indicated, 1.1 billion of that money comes directly from the state uh, through the education trust fund and the formulas that we have. Uh, we work closely uh, with the state, particularly on the Curling Commission, which is talking about the operating funds. Uh, there was also a NOP commission at the state level, which talked about school construction and the process for us to be able to build and renovate schools here in the state of Maryland. Um, as a result of our working with the delegation on the 22nd team, we got local legislation passed as part of the uh, General Assembly session that gives us new alternative ways of trying to finance school education, construction in Prince George's County. As part of that budget adoption, we adopted obviously the school's uh, budget and its uh, capital improvement program, as well as a resolution that established a work group uh, between uh, the county government, the county council, and the Prince George's County Public Schools uh, to move forward with trying to see how we can do it better. The question we raised, it's not the money issue. We got $2 billion to go into public school, and I'm sure Luffy will get up here, we say we need more. And I say we would all say we need more, but it's how we're spending that funds is the real question. One of the things that we did over the last four years for the first time in over 20 years was to do a performance audit. Now this is separate and apart from the issues of graduation that was done at the state level. This was a performance audit of how the school system was working, particularly on its business operation side. So it's the first one we've done in over 20 years. And so we're trying to implement uh, recommendations from that. As part of this year's budget, we set aside additional funds and asked the school system to set aside additional funds for the second round of a performance audit, talking about human, human relations, human resources, the hiring process as part of that process. Because let's be honest, both for county government, state government, for the public school system, you know, anywhere between 70 to 80% of our budget goes to personnel. Uh, and so uh, what we're paying people, how we're retaining them, uh, those are all big issues that we have at the county. So that's on the budget. Two other things that we're trying to complete this year, um, I'm not saying that we will, though one of them probably will. Uh, one is we're doing a, a complete review of our zoning code in Prince George's County. We've not done that in over 50 years. Uh, we've been going through a multi-year process working with the Park and Planning Commission. Uh, on that, we're now, legislation has been submitted to the County Council, so it's in legislative form now. 
Uh, we're going to be hosting a series of public meetings, Committee of the Whole. We had our first one on May 14th. We have a, a, a Committee of the Whole coming up this Monday on the 4th. There'll be ones that are set aside for public comments uh, as part of that process. So what we're trying to do is streamline our process, but also to uh, give more public input to the residents as part of the development going on in our community. Uh, last thing I'll talk about is we're also undertaking a comprehensive housing strategy in Prince George's County for the first time. Uh, it's been about a two-year process now. We're talking about issues about workforce housing, affordable housing as part of that. We've had a series of uh, public meetings on that. Uh, we're hopeful to get that uh, kind of guideline blueprint for us done by the end of this year so when the new administration comes in both at the town level and the county council we'll be able to implement some of those strategies and toolboxes. Other than that the last thing I'll just touch on on, on Maglev I forgot about that. Uh, the Prince George's County Council um, uh, adopted a resolution last month uh, in essence saying we do not want uh, to transfer the Baltimore Washington Parkway for any other purpose. Keep it with the National Park Service this will limit both the opportunity for maglev and for and for potentially the hyperloop if they're trying to go up the DW Parkway since that is a federal um, road. Um, and so my only comment is, yeah, talk to the governor since it's his project, but ultimately it's a federal representative. So Congressman Boyer, Congressman Brown, uh, Senators Cardin and Van Hollen are important to contact as well because ultimately that's how it's being funded right now is federal. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity to represent you. Uh, thank you for those who live in the 4th District who didn't file against me. So, gotcha. David Black, then Colin, then Jerry. Uh, you mentioned you are uh, working on redoing of zoning. Correct. What's the purpose? What changing the zoning? What would that do for us? How do we benefit from that? So, I guess conceptually it's this way. We, we have not reviewed or updated the, we go through a legislative process every year changing the zone, zoning code, right? That's for your benefit. <laughs> no. No, we get all this benefit. I mean, it, well, listen, you know, I understand it. we want the right kind of development in Prince George's County. Now, what the right kind is is subjective. Let's be honest with that. However, what we want is to be open for business in Prince George's County. One of the big issues, and I'm sure you've heard this during the campaign, is, listen, Prince George's County is mostly residential and suburban, right? So you as taxpayers, me as a property owner, are paying taxes when we have to fund our public school system, when we have to do our public safety. What we're trying to do is shift it so we have more commercial tax base and less reliance on the residential tax base. So we're talking about transit-oriented development. The, you see what's going on at New Carrollton Metro. You know, with Kaiser Permanente coming in, you see what happened, or whether you agree with it or not. You have MGM, the National Harbor. Uh, we're having a new regional medical center coming in in Largo. Those. So what we're trying to do is not, not streamline, but make our zoning process updating it to the 21st century because it's over 50 years old. And what we have to do is maintain and, and, and enforce and enhance the opportunities for residents to be in the front end of the process for development so it's the right kind of development that's occurring and also making sure who has the ultimate authority saying yay or nay because there is this distinction between the Park and Planning Commission which is an appointed body and we get to confirm them but it's appointed by the county executive and us the county council sitting as the district council which is your elected representative who should have that ultimate say about approving a project or not. So that's part of the discussion that we're having on about the zoning Good morning, Councilman. Hopefully I haven't shown that in your, as your county council representative. 
I don't, I don't think I have, but. And I'm not saying that it's a way, but I always try to make sure you bring it back home in terms of green up. Mm -hmm. And so I did hear about the most recent uh, budget, uh, $4 billion, and it is the largest ever. Uh, but when I read about it in the Capital Gazette, I don't know if you saw that article, um, he did mention the school issue and the renovations. And the two schools that were mentioned were in Booth. Uh, I think it was Tooth Road Elementary, sure. got some goodies, uh, as well as Bowie High School Annex. And so I was wondering, were there any things that were included for Green Bluff in terms of uh, incorporation? And then the, uh, and then the uh, uh, other question that I had, Okay. <laughs> so let me let me say this. Obviously, the Capital Gazette is the Bowie Blade, so their focus was on Bowie schools. So that's why you only read it in that way. The other thing is, and not not to get into the minutia here. That's why I talked about this new opportunity for alternative financing for us to do schools. Our process in the non commission, the state commission went through a review over a year of how the state and the counties work together in order to get additional funds. So when you talk about Tulip Grove Elementary School, that's been on in the CIP for over 10 years, and it's finally getting done. So that's how long it's taking for us to do schools. So uh, with respect to Greenbelt specific schools, obviously we had the renovate, major renovation of uh, Dora Kennedy. It used to be the middle school when the new middle school opened up. So I can say this, the fourth council district has done very well with new schools over the last 10 or 12 years. Now, my colleagues in other parts of the county might not say that for their area, so just keep that in mind. I know all politics is local, but. Okay, we're, we, uh, we're take, Jerry, I'm gonna hold on you because you asked a question, Lynn, Terry. I, we have one more person I said we're gonna be brief. I also wanted to ask about this one, just how you Real yeah, we've had this discussion. I've been at the city council meeting. I think we're, we're, we're the, where we need to be with respect to that. Obviously, the city should also engage uh, in the zoning process now that we have a bill draft. You know, you've been engaged in the process up until now. I, I don't think that's going to be an issue, in all honesty, at least in our conversations with parking plumbing. Okay, this is the begin discussion. It's not the end of the discussion. We're going to be around and answer questions. Then, real brief. Morning, Mayor. How are you doing? growth 
right now it's mostly in the middle and high school, you know, because populations go up and down. Clearly that card is growing. Uh, so right now we are making efforts on the middle school level. Before I go to our school board member, uh, I failed to introduce a number of people. Colin Bird is, is on the Greenbelt City Council. Um, the, new, the new mayor, the new mayor of New Carrollton, Dwayne Rosenberg, Dwayne. Uh, the current mayor uh, and newly elected, re-elected mayor, Len Carey from University Park. His predecessor, John Tavori, uh, sitting right behind him. Um, and also from Greenbelt, uh, the mayor and the Jordan was here. He did to a Greenbelt activity as well as Jay Davis, the mayor pro tem. Uh, now we're going to bring up um, Lupe Grady, who represents a large part of the 22nd district uh, on the school board. I'm, I'm getting to that. He's speaking soon. Um, uh, you know, we talked about funding for schools. About 80% of funding goes to teachers. So, and because it's labor intensive, and while you might not be happy with your child or grandchildren, every teacher, um, that's where most of the money goes. Um, so we should be aware of that. Emmett Jordan's just returned, the mayor of Greenbelt. I'm sure. Okay, um, looking great, he's on the clock, uh, three minutes and then questions, then we have another special guest. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll start with um, a little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a proud parent of two children attending Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, my background or work experience has been in youth development for the last 20 years in a nonprofit um, and focused on low income youth, Latino primarily, and African American. Uh, it's been the focus to do to have uh, to provide access and opportunities that support education. Uh, social, emotional, workforce case management, and a few, just to give you a little background. So I'm very invested when it comes to our students. I'd like to give you a little glimpse of like the work that I've been focused on the last uh, four years. Um, just to give you, uh, I serve in the policy <coughs> committee, I'm the vice chair in the student academic achievement committee. Uh, those were structures that were created as I came in, those committees, and so, really had to learn really quickly and, and trying to uh, learn what was the best way in which I was going to be able to address the issues that are brought before me, the emails that I receive. So I'll give you an example, recess was a policy. Um, that was loud and clear from Greenbelt, Berlin Heights, um, we're very strong communicating that. And what you would think would be a obvious or something that is a quick, done deal, uh, I did research against Howard County, they had a comprehensive policy which I wanted to pretty much um, replicate for us. Um, they, it took them three years. I laughed. And then as I started the process, part of them was championing that issue, uh, educating my colleagues, um, and then trying to bring up the table, competing everyone from the principals to teachers to this committee to the parents. And everybody has a different lens in which they view. For me, it was like what was right for the students. So the AP uh, policy was passed this year and it went into effect this year. So implementation um, started this year and now it's just even I continue to sort of set things in motion to like follow up uh, to make sure reasons are not taking from students in a punitive way is be to, to address behavior. I give you that as an example because that took just about three years and it was um, just getting everybody's perspective. Uh, I think I also wanted to mention community schools. I served um, that has been working with my colleagues, Mary Roach, Kate Wallace, and even PGCA. Been very involved with them, specifically Amity Pope. Um, community schools came through um, us through the Parent Engagement Committee, and then it's been with us. Com community, community schools is it's something I'm very familiar with too, because I have a background on that. But it's an evidence-based approach, um, and you will see that through the Every Student Succeed Act, and it's sort of coming from the state now. This mandate. We're looking at how we're going to hold ourselves accountable to, to doing the work. Community school um, serves as a hub, the school serves as a hub, and you're, we're putting a community school uh, resource person, coordinator. But the policy that we're working is to look at doing this in a systemic way. It's looking at making sure that there's checks and balances, that there's steering committees that are looking at how this is going to be implemented. Uh, the community school coordinator, for example, will do a needs assessment at a school and work closely with the principal or other other people there, teachers, educators, 
and engaging other stakeholders to address the needs. An example, um, I know Montgomery County has this as well. Um, if there's a school and their need, safety is an issue of concern for that particular school, they would probably engage the police department, probably engage other folks that are interested in, in really addressing those issues and work as a team to very specifically do interventions. But it's also academically focused. If, if there's a, 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 through the assessment that's done with teachers, parents, community members, it could, you know, you really start to really get more to what are the other needs that our students are facing and the supports that they need. I serve in the student academic achievement and through that suspension rates is something that's not, does not look very favorable for Prince George's County. I'm a strong supporter of restored justice. We put budget funding on that and that looks at making cultural changes and empowering our students um, and addressing conflict but also encouraging a culture of respect. Um, Navians, uh, software that uh, school counselors have been requesting for years. We passed a budget last year that included Navians and a pilot for that. That looks at giving uh, middle school and high school students a way to looking how to access and how to know how they're going to apply for college. Start planning, goal setting, and giving parents and students a way to really do that. In, 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 in a, so we're piloting that. Uh, the, so I can go on about different things. I will say that the last thing is, I want to say, uh, because this relates to the school's capacity, the three middle schools that I have are William Ward, Greenbelt, and Charles Carroll. William Ward is 134% capacity. Greenbelt's at 119. Charles Carroll is at 149. We are looking to do it to two new middle schools. Those two, the two middle schools um, would sort of, sort of look at when we get to that reboundering or figuring out how to um, alleviate the overcrowding. But one of the things that I look at those schools is looking at they have the supports that they need. I'm a big proponent. I really do appreciate the work that Alonso Washington done with the Next Gen. Uh, actually, the Latin American Center received that. And it's actually as well. So, but the, 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 the thing with the schools, what we've learned, it takes about six years for schools to get done. So some of the work moving forward that, that I started in regards to this, uh, we're looking at public-private partnerships um, that leverage school uh, district and county resources to significantly expand borrowing power and speed up the sign and construction process. We're exploring everything. Uh, we're looking at, um, I've looked at supporting it along with my other colleagues, a bill that Senator Rosepep and really diving deep into what are the things that we can look out of the box for older students looking at what are other alternative ways in which we can look to do further support. Because sometimes the 18 year old that is in the ninth grade is feels a lot of shame. So what are the other alternatives that we can offer and strongly support academically? So we look at that. I just, um, I will stop. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to take about four minutes for questions and we want to go to the next uh, piece of the program. We have a special guest. Um, Yes.
I, first of all, I'm fully supportive of the language immersion um, programs, and I have been, and I've been an advocate for them. Um, I think that um, that has been loud and clear. A lot of parents have come out, and we appreciate that level of advocacy because this work is about working together and learning what the needs are. Um, I think there's a balance of the specialty programs as well as other resources that we have to distribute equitably. The, the, we did uh, target the North, that's called the Center and the South, to specifically have programs to make sure access was given to those overall students. Um, I think one of the things that we've been asking is continuing to really have a more, we're looking for, for me going into, and if I'm elected, continue to look at more of what the data is around how all of these specialty programs are working and making sure that we're using, we're using that because that's, that's where a lot of things are going, accountability, and we want to use that. If that's there, that's going to continue to serve as well to continue to either expand and build upon the work that's being already done. Okay, and just for people who are not as familiar, specialty schools are like the Montessori schools, the French immersion, Spanish immersion, okay. science and tech program. The community schools concept is to have wraparound services, counseling, uh, social workers, maybe healthcare in the school as a hub, as Luby talked about, to, to help the whole child, not just the academic side. We're going to take uh, one more question, then we have to move on. I said we'd be tight. This gentleman here who hasn't spoken. Yes? Oh, yeah. I'm a teacher at the schools. I've got a list of 10 education solutions. Too long to discuss them. Just wonder if I could just give it to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, and I'll just say this. For, for any of you that have, I'm always open. I get emails. When I get those emails, I'll look at them. I'll give you an example, shortage of nurses. That's something I'm looking at. I don't wait for solutions to come to me or things to come before me through administration. I'll go out as a board member and look at other ways to partnering. So I'm looking to have a coordinating a meeting with Prince George's Community College and administration to look at if there's a way that we can create a pipeline for nurses because the shortage of nurses is across nationally, not just in Prince George's County, but it's an issue that I'm concerned about. So I would love to hear rattle them you. off without explaining them. You can do it or you can email them. Um, email better. Okay. 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 Um, well, the great issue of education has, in this county has been deported. And I don't know how you can talk and, and just pretend it didn't exist. And the audit found that there's a culture of non-compliance with regulations. And that needs to be discussed. Okay. And the state now is having a bigger audit because the audit found so much smoke, what's really needed is a serious investigation, not just an audit. I think those are really real concerns, and I think that we are having those discussions, sir. Uh, and I think and I think we are and I think that you know I'll be very honest when you know I'm all about looking at what the issues are but I think it's important how we discuss the issues and how we're looking to resolve the issues and I only say this because as I door knocked two weeks ago or a week ago I learned that the, the what's been out there as an error for Prince George's County is it affects the students that are also doing what they're supposed to be doing so a student called Maryland University and she was told that they were concerned about our grading system. And this is a student that's done everything they're supposed to do. So we are the adults. And we're the ones that have to conduct ourselves. And so if I'm willing to talk to anybody. If you got solutions, I'm willing to listen. But it is about us working together. This is not about, I, don't, this, I have a full time. I think a couple of you mentioned limitations. Most of the board members have full time jobs. Only two do not work. And I can say I'm invested because I have children in the system. Now, I have a way in which if I needed to pull my kids out, I could. But no, I believe in our public school system. And I'm a part of the public school system. Okay. And I will continue to fight the public school system. But we have to make our choice and put people that are going to be willing to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, we said we wanted to share what we're doing, some of our thoughts, to have a conversation, to deal with public policy that affects all of you, and also to address the issue of accountability. Um, you may agree with some of the votes, all of the votes, none of the votes of people up here. So part of our program today was to have that conversation to deal with policy. The second thing we wanted to talk about was politics. 
because they're related. And in um, 24 days, there'll be a, a general election, and in 12 days, early voting starts. So we also want to deal with politics, because you will have the opportunity to put people in public office, governor, county executive, state's attorney, delegate, county council, school board, who you essentially center. <laughs> Yikes. Um, and it's important to remember that all of those positions are on loan. No one owns them. They're on loan for four years. And you can decide that your representatives are doing the decent work and put them back or not. And that's your call. We have a track record. We have a perspective. We're uh, supporting a number of candidates. Uh, and we wanted to sort of shift the program in the political side. Uh, to get us started, uh, I'm going to bring in a special guest. But I also want to, before the crowd, well, we'll go with him first. Uh, one of the leaders, uh, formerly in the state senate, a friend of mine who was instrumental in important progressive public policy in the state around the environment, around criminal justice, about compassion for people who are locked up, uh, and one of the smartest people I know um, is the Attorney General for the state of Maryland. Uh, he lives in an adjoining county. Uh, he clearly has represented the whole state. Every step of the way, he has fought President Trump with all his bad and stupid policies. He, he's gone up against the governor, and he's been honest. He's been principled. He's one of the great leaders. I'm proud to introduce the Attorney General, Brian Frosch. Paul, thank you very much for those kind words. I'll lie about you sometime, too. Um, uh, really, it's, it, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I know they're all leaving, but you all have great representatives in this area. Um, the, and just by way of example, one, uh, the Attorney General of Maryland, unlike the Attorneys General of most of the other states in the country, 41 of them, does not have what are called common law powers. So that means. I can't sue on my own to protect you, to protect the welfare of Marylanders. I either have to get the governor's permission or I have to get the General Assembly to pass a law. And uh, after the election in 2016, uh, and when President Trump issued his first Muslim ban executive order, I wrote to Governor Hogan and I said, please give me the authority to go into court and enjoin this. It's unconstitutional. It's also stupid. But it's unconstitutional. And uh, uh, I, I couldn't get a response. So I, I turned to Paul and Ann and Tawana and uh, Alonzo, and uh, I asked them to pass legislation to give me that authority. And, um, you know, the, the General Assembly is in session for 90 days a year. It, it takes them about 75 days to clear their collective throats. Uh, <laughs> But they passed that bill in two weeks. And so we were able to get into court. We were able to get into court in time to sue to enjoin uh, Trump's second Muslim ban uh, executive order. And since then, uh, we have been able to take him on, thanks to the legislation that they passed. Um, and, and I know Todd's trying to escape, but I wanted to say what a great council man is. Everybody left. I didn't know where they left. <laughs> um, okay. He's a great. He's a great uh, county councilman. Um, you know, we've been able to sue him to protect uh, the Affordable Care Act as a result of the legislation they passed. <laughs> to protect women's right to choose, because Trump's trying to take that away. Uh, this latest thing about the census, you know, where they want to put a citizenship question on the census? This is, this is just a, a dagger at the heart of American democracy. What they want to do is they want to drive down democratic representation in Congress. And they know if they ask if you're a citizen, they know people are going to refuse to answer. 
20% of Marylanders in the last census didn't respond. And the Census, uh, the census Bureau has done study after study to determine whether if you ask people about citizenship, whether they'll respond. And what they found overwhelmingly is it will drive down responses. And what that means is um, the count in Maryland, which is according to the Constitution, supposed to be an actual enumeration, will be much less than the number of people who are actually living in our state. Because even if you're a citizen, even if you're a green card holder, even if you've got a visa, you may be a little worried about responding to Donald Trump to identify yourself as, as uh, someone, though of foreign extraction, uh, is legally uh, allowed to be here. And we're supposed to count folks who are undocumented as well, because uh, that's what the Constitution requires. And all of this uh, is uh, determinative about the aid that we get from the federal government the amount of health care uh, assistance that we get in Maryland, the amount of housing assistance, the amount of education assistance, all determined by the number of uh, folks who live here. They're trying to drive our numbers down, reduce our representation in Congress, and cheat us on uh, financial matters. Sorry to go off on a rant about that one in particular, um, but it's very dangerous. And uh, another one that, that uh, we're doing really important is we're suing Trump over the emoluments clause. Um, yeah. The emoluments clauses are our nation's original anti-corruption law. The foreign emoluments clause says that no federal official can, any, can receive any gift or emolument of any kind whatever from a foreign state. And the domestic emoluments clause says that the President of the United States gets his salary which can neither be raised nor lowered during his term in office, and no other emolument from the United States or any of them or any state. And by the way, you know, Trump's salary is 400,000 bucks a year, uh, plus Air Force One, the White House, free food, free booze. It's, it's not a bad gig, right? Um, but it's not enough for him. He violates both of those clauses, domestic and foreign, every single day. He's getting payments from foreign governments, India, China, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Indonesia, Malaysia, and many others on at least a monthly basis for his properties all over the country. He's getting, he's getting payments from them through the Trump Post Office Hotel, and he's got that by a lease. The lease itself says no federal official can receive any benefit from this lease, and yet uh, here's old Donald Trump, and uh, he says, ah, it's okay, it's perfectly okay. He's just taking these payments from foreign governments and lobbyists and uh, Republican organizations through his uh, washing machine for money, the Trump Post Office Hotel. Um, so, you know, thanks to the work of your delegates and Senator, uh, we're able to engage uh, in those efforts. And I, I, I have to say, you know, the midterm elections are coming up. I'm sure you were as uh, surprised and disappointed as I was on November 8th, 2016. Um, the morning of November 9th, I got an email from a friend of mine who lives in Massachusetts. He's a historian. And he said, uh, you know, the same night that Donald Trump got elected president, Massachusetts legalized marijuana. And he said, I, I, I think the message must be, when they go low, we get high. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's not enough, folks. We got to do better. We got to send him a message in 2018. And we, we want to send all these folks uh, back to Annapolis and to Upper Marlboro, and we need to elect Democratic congressmen from Maryland. Uh, we need to re-elect Ben Cardin, and P.S. I'm running for re-election in November. Um, but uh, thank you very much for being here to support this great team, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to say hi and be with you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian.
Uh, we have a little business to take care of. Brian talked about electing Democrats, and that's why we ended the policy side, now we're in the politics. Uh, there are three people who are going to be on the ballot in the primary who are running for the Democratic Central Committee. Uh, I want to introduce them, Stephanie Hicks. Stephanie, why don't you stand up? <laughs> Stephanie has been a long time uh, Civic Association leader in the eastern part of the district in the Lanham area off of uh, um, uh, 450. Um, then we have uh, Danny, where are you? Danny, why don't you stand up? <laughs> Danny Charlie. Uh, is in Hyattsville, um, is a good friend and really is fighting for a progressive agenda, so we really are looking to the future, not to the past. Thank you. Uh, Emmett, are you still here? I know you were back and forth. Uh, Emmett Jordan uh, is also uh, running for the Central Committee, so let's hear it for Emmett, even though he's not here. Um, so uh, our team has gotten together and we've made a number of endorsements. Um, they shouldn't come as a surprise to you, and you might not agree with all of them. Uh, we hope you consider them. Uh, we're supporting our own county executive, my longtime friend, Rashawn Baker, uh, in the gubernatorial primary, June 26th. Uh, we're supporting Angela also broke for a county executive, um, and a number of other people as well, obviously Danielle Glaros, uh, Todd, and everybody else who is up here. In the back are lawn signs for a number of these candidates. Um, if you support them, and we hope you do, you heard from some of them today, we hope you take them and put them on your lawn. Uh, one thing about signs, if you see them in the middle of the, of the road or on a corner in a commercial area, anybody could put them there. But you are respected in your communities. I know that, or else you wouldn't be here. People look to you. You spend your Saturday morning trying to get more information and share your opinions and thoughts and hold people accountable. So when you put a lawn sign in your front yard, it says, I've done some homework, I have an idea, this is who I'm supporting, and you'd be surprised how much other people around you look to you. So it's much more important when, when signs are in people's front yards than they are on a street corner or in a commercial area. So please consider taking a sign of the candidates. The other thing I wanted to point out to you, uh, early voting is, like I said, it's, uh, starts on the 14th, goes to 21st, and then election day is Tuesday the 26th. As I said, you're great leaders, you're respected. If you would like to put in two hours to help these candidates and give out our sample ballot on election day, We'd love to have that support. Um, you, get, you get to wear a t-shirt that has all of our names on it. Um, you get to talk to your neighbors. You know, hopefully it'll be a sunny day and you can bring a chair. Um, and you can talk to people. It's really a community role. It keeps your ear to the ground to find out what issues are important. And we want to hear back from you if you hear about X, Y, or Z or any opinions. On the two back tables, we have all the major precincts in the 22nd district. And we also, on the left side, we have a listing of the early voting sites. If you would like to help us, and there'll be instructions in the, in the packet, all you have to do is show up. Um, if you'd like to help give out our literature and help the people who you heard from today, we'd love to have you. If you happen to be there at lunchtime, hopefully we'll get you a sandwich and a cold drink. Um, so. In the back, you can look for your precinct. We always recommend working in your own neighborhood where you know people. Some people come to vote and they'll know, yeah, I want to vote for X for governor, but they're not sure about delegate or school board or other positions. So your advice, your sample ballot that you will give them is instructive. And it gets back to you being a local community leader. So, when we break, and we're going to break in just a, another short minute, um, take a sign, take a minute to fill out, look at the precincts. Uh, we'll have some staff back there to help you. Uh, look, we weren't sure how many people would show up today. Uh, we had over 50. We think it's a great testament. A lot of the candidates are going to hang around and, and talk to you one on one if you have questions for them. We only had a limited amount of time. Sorry we had to cut off questions. But with that, sign up. 
drive safely, and above all else, don't forget to vote. Thank you.